Welcome back to Introduction to Logic, Unit 3, Lecture 2, Part 3. In this mini-lecture, you'll learn how to construct truth tables to evaluate symbolized deductive arguments for their validity. Now, before we begin setting up truth tables for arguments, let's remind ourselves of what we're looking for. Deductive arguments are evaluated on two criteria, validity and soundness. Validity has everything to do with the form of the argument, and soundness has to do with the truth of the premises. Except for the case of logically true and false propositions, soundness is going to be determined by the facts of the world. But validity is exclusively a matter of how the argument is put together, how it's structured. When deductive arguments are put together in the right way, they will be successful. But when not, they're fallacious. So validity is the state of a deductive argument where the premises, if assumed to be true, will force us to accept the conclusion as true. Truth tables allow us to check an argument's form to determine if it's valid or not. Now there are four easy steps to creating a truth table to check the validity of an ordinary language deductive argument. First, we must symbolize the argument using the skills we've already learned. But instead of writing out the argument in standard form, that is, putting each premise on a separate line from the conclusion, for a truth table, we'll write each symbolized statement out on the same line, separating each with a single forward slash to indicate premises, or a double forward slash to indicate the conclusion. Once that's done, we fill in the truth values for each individual proposition and work to identify the truth function of each statement in the argument. Now, of course, there are many different ways an argument might achieve validity and equally many ways that it might fail. Fortunately, you'll remember that there is one case in which we always know if an argument is invalid, when the premises are true but the conclusion is false. The premise of a deductive argument are supposed to provide sufficient conditions for the conclusion to follow. So just like in a hypothetical statement, if the antecedent is true but the consequent is false, we know there's something has gone wrong. So if there is any line on the truth table where the premises are true but the conclusion is false, we know for certain that the argument is invalid. Something has gone wrong. Not only that, but any other argument that has the same form will also be invalid, regardless of the content of the premises. Let's take a look at this argument. There are few subjects, like applying the death penalty to children, that gets folks worked up. If minors who commit murder are equally responsible for their crimes as adults, they should receive the death penalty. But they're not so minors should not receive the death penalty. This is one of the reasons that symbolic logic is so useful. It helps us to focus on the validity of the argument while not getting distracted by its emotive content. So first, let's symbolize the argument and put it into standard form to see what we're working with. In the first premise, we're saying that M is a sufficient condition for D. In the second premise, we're stating that M is not the case. Finally, we're concluding that it's not the case, that D. Having symbolized the argument, it's probably already clear that there's something gone wrong here. If we assume that M is a sufficient condition for D, but we don't have that sufficient condition, that doesn't mean that we can't have D. But just in case this isn't clear, we can demonstrate this using a truth table. To set up the truth table, we put all the statements on a single line, divided by single and double forward slashes. Remember to use single slashes to separate the premises from one another, and a double slash to separate the conclusion from the premises. Next, plug in the truth values for each possible universe of discourse, which of course is determined by the two truth values to the power of the number of simple propositions appearing in the argument. In this case, we'll end up with four lines. Next, we solve for the truth function 
of each statement, one use universe at a time, always looking for a case where all the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. As we see, there's no proof that the argument is invalid in this first universe. So, we go to the next one, and we do the same thing again. Again, in universe 2, we don't find conditions necessary to prove that the argument is invalid, so we go on to the next universe. This time, when we solve for the truth function of each statement, we find that indeed, this argument will allow for true premises and a false conclusion, which can never happen for a valid argument. Remember, it doesn't have to be the case that the proof of invalidity is found in every universe. If it's invalid in even one, that it's invalid in all possible worlds. But just to be thorough, let's go ahead and fill in the last line just to complete our truth table. Because we discover that in universe 3 the premises would turn out to be true and the conclusion is false, is all the evidence we need to demonstrate that this argument is busted. And this is such a common mistake, this fallacy gets its own name. It's called denying the antecedent. Let's examine another argument using exactly the same terms. If minors who commit murder are equally responsible for their crimes as adults, they should receive the death penalty. And they are. So, minors should receive the death penalty. Now to see the argument clearly, let's put it in standard form. Here we see M is assumed to be a sufficient condition for D. In the second premise, we're asserting that indeed M is true. Hence, D should follow as a conclusion. But just in case the inference is unclear, let's build a truth table to see if our intuition is correct. Just as before, we place each statement of the argument on a single line separated by single and double forward slashes and then fill in our truth values. Next, we solve for the truth function of our only compound prep proposition, which is premise 1. Then we do the same for each subsequent logical world. With this argument, we find no possible combination of true premises and false conclusion. So we know that this argument must be valid. This is one of the most common forms of deduction in propositional logic. In fact, it was first identified by Theophrastus, a student and the successor of Aristotle, who was the first philosopher to clearly delineate the difference between induction and deduction. This argument is called modus ponens, or the way of affirmation, since we're affirming the antecedent of the first premise. Here we see a similar but slightly different argument from the last one. If minors who commit murder are equally responsible for their crimes as adults, they should receive the death penalty. But it's not the case that they deserve the death penalty. So minors are not equally responsible for their crimes. To make this argument really clear, let's symbolize it and put it into standard form. In this argument, instead of affirming the antecedent of the first premise, we're denying its consequent. Now remember that the consequent of a hypothetical claim is supposed to be a necessary condition for the antecedent. So if we deny the consequent, we should end up with a denial of the antecedent. But to prove it, let's work out our truth table to make sure our intuition is correct. Following the same procedure, we set up our truth table and plug in the truth values. Next, we solve for the truth function of each premise in each universe. Once we've completed our truth table, we see that there are no logical worlds where the premises are true and the conclusion false. This means that this is also a valid argument. 
It's called modus tollens, or the way of denial, since we're denying the necessary condition of the first premise of the argument. The previous arguments were all dealing with material implication, but let's look at a case where we have a disjunctive premise. Either minors who commit murder are equally responsible for their crimes as adults, or they should receive the death penalty. But it's not the case that they are equally responsible, so they should receive the death penalty. Symbolizing the argument and putting it into standard form allows us to see the structure of the argument more clearly. The first premise tells us that either M or D must be true. Now, perhaps both are true, but disjunction tells us that at least one of them must be true. Notice that the second premise is denying M. Given the meaning of disjunction, if we assume that one of the disjuncts in the premise is false, logic would dictate that the other must be true, hence our conclusion D. But let's test this with a truth table to see if our logical intuitions are holding up. Building our truth table should now be easy. Place the statement on a single line separated by slashes, then plug in the truth values. Once we've got our table set up, we solve the truth function of the main operators for each compound proposition one universe at a time. Then we do the same thing for each universe. Once our truth table is complete, we can see that there are no logical worlds where the premises are true and the conclusion false. Thus, once again, we have a valid argument. This one is called disjunctive syllogism, since the first premise is a disjunction. As you've no doubt begun to realize, the more terms that appear in an argument, the more complex our truth table is going to be. If minors who commit murder are equally responsible for their crimes as adults, then they should receive the death penalty. If they should receive the death penalty, then we should feel sorry for them. So, if minors who commit murder are equally responsible, then we should feel sorry for them. In this argument, we have three hypothetical claims, two of which are premises and one conclusion. Note that the proposition D appears in both of the premises but not in the conclusion. This is not unlike the middle term we learned about in categorical syllogisms in the, unit, in the last unit. Since D is the consequent of the first premise and the antecedent of the second, it acts as a kind of connector between M and W. This is also like the transitive property in mathematics, which of course is just the logic of numbers. To validate the form of this argument, we set up our truth table. Notice how much longer it's getting simply because we added one more proposition. Next, we solve for the main operator of each statement one universe at a time. Remember, we're looking for a logical universe where all the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. If we don't find one, and having exhausted all the logical possibilities, then we'll know that the argument is valid. Keep going until you've exhausted all the logical possible worlds, or until you find one where the premises are true, but the conclusion is false. After solving the truth function of each proposition in each possible logical world, we find that there are no cases where the premises are true, but the conclusion false. This is what we call a hypothetical syllogism, and it too is valid. These are just a few of the many possible valid arguments we'll learn about moving forward. The nice thing is, Having proven these arguments are valid using truth tables, we know that validity only applies to the form of an argument. Therefore, any argument that follows one of these forms will be valid. We never have to prove it again. That's the power of truth tables to demonstrate our logical intuitions. If we've set up our truth tables correctly, 
and tested an argument in all possible logical worlds, we can forever use an argument with the same form, and we know it has to be valid. Of course, whether or not the premises actually turn out to be true is a matter of empirical investigation, which we'll put off until later. That's it for this mini-lecture. We'll see you next time.